1989, a man called Bob Lazar walked into a Las Vegas TV station and gave a remarkable interview. He said that he'd worked out in the Nevada desert at a top secret facility known as Area 51. He said he worked on a highly classified project, reverse engineering recovered alien spacecraft. His story was a worldwide sensation, and Area 51 became a household name, synonymous with UFOs, secret projects, and little green men. And yet, neither the US government nor its military have ever denied his claims, and they still don't officially confirm that Area 51 exists, despite satellite photos proving it does. Many dismiss Bob Lazar as a fantasist, and yet others see him as a whistleblower, exposing a government cover-up of UFOs and alien contact. A once secret air base in the Nevada desert is marking an unofficial anniversary today. <laughs> Area 51 was one of the most secretive places on the planet, but that anonymity vanished forever because of what happened 25 years ago. A controversial electronics whiz told a fantastic tale during a TV interview, and the story still reverberates today. The I-team's George Knapp played a part in what became an international sensation. He's here with an update. Uh, setting the stage, Dave, you might not know this, but uh, 25 years ago, a young anchor woman <laughs> named Paula Francis and I I were prepping for the five o'clock news when we learned that our scheduled live interview had canceled. We placed a call to aviator John Lear to ask if he could get a friend of his to fill the spot, a guy who reportedly worked out near Area 51 and had seen flying saucers out there. It sounded outrageous at the time, but that interview with Bob Lazar turned Area 51 upside down. We coaxed a reluctant Lazar into returning to Las Vegas to talk about it. I don't know. Sometimes I really do regret it, regret it and almost I almost feel like apologizing to him, saying that, you know, I'm sorry I let things out. Can I have my job back? My personal opinion, uh, based on comments I've gotten from uh, the Deputy Director for Science and Technology at CIA, would seem to indicate that Bob was perhaps an unwitting participant in a program designed to introduce someone with a technical background to some elements of the UFO research projects going on out at the test site. I have no doubts that Lazar actually was in a place where top secret investigations were going on. I'm not sure about all the details that have emerged from his account, but he certainly gives me the impression that he was actually there. Do I believe Bob Lazar? My answer to that is yes. And heck, it's going, it's going on uh, eight years that I've known him. His story has never changed. He wasn't in it for the publicity. He was, surely wasn't in it for the money. He lost everything he had. Uh, I believe he's since, since totally sincere. As far as I can tell, he's a bright guy who t tells a great tale and who's told it often to people who have not checked on him, who accept the notion that, well, the government wiped his slate clean. Basically, I think uh, he had an experience. I think uh, he saw some things that shocked him, was subject to some conditions and experiences that were very unnerving to him and very profound. He said, you would love to see what's what's out there because it's like beyond science fiction he said and i wish i could talk to you about it but i can't and that's as close as he ever got to telling me anything that happened out there you'll find many people who have seen these discs question is where do they come from uh, bob lazar may be one of the few people who can tell us that they're from somewhere else 
I've no doubt that there's a relatively small number of people within the intelligence, military intelligence and scientific and technical intelligence community who are aware of what's going on and an even smaller group who are actually organizing top secret research into this phenomenon. There's been an operating airbase out at the location known as Area 51 since the 1950s when it was home to the CIA's top secret SR-71 Blackbird spy plane. Then in the 1970s, it became the test flight center for the F-117 stealth fighter and the B-2 stealth bomber. It's fairly public knowledge that we have a super secret facility uh, in the mountains uh, in northern Nevada uh, referred to as Groom Lake, uh, Area 51 of the uh, Nellis uh, Air Force Base Test Range. Uh, it's also been uh, referred to as, uh, as Dreamland. This is an area that has been known but officially denied for many decades. All of our super secret aircraft uh, have been developed and test flown out in this particular area. So it only makes sense that if you have something as sophisticated as a flying saucer and the related technology to that, that would certainly be one of the prime locations you'd want to go. What you see is an ordinary looking Air Force base. It's nothing to write home about, but because the government won't talk about it, everyone wants to see it. The military has never said there are no UFOs. It's never directly denied any of the Area 51 stories. It would have been so simple when these claims came out, these Papoose Lake claims, for the military to simply say, look, we have nothing there. They could take a few reporters to this area and show them nothing there. The military hasn't done it. The military has stonewalled. It has remained silent. And that's the most damning thing that they can do. Area 51 to this day is not acknowledged. That is to say the Air Force does not admit that it exists. This status has been maintained very carefully, particularly in the last few years. The puzzle is that the base has clearly been very active for quite a while and you can see that there are about uh, 700 to 1,000 people traveling from Las Vegas every day. So essentially the bulk of what has gone on there in the last 10 years um, has not emerged from the black. This airplane was, the program was terminated, the airplanes were put in mothballs for 20 years before they admitted the existence of the aircraft. There's programs that they're working on today that are 50 years ahead of anything that you and I can even conceive of, and that we may never, they ne may never see the light of day. Would you say it's America's most top secret military base? As far as, a, as far as an operational test facility, it's probably the most secret test facility in the free world, yes. So there is no question that the facility is there that the government has said very little in the past about it. Now, the real question, I suppose, is are there any flying saucers out there? No one had associated flying saucers with Area 51 until Bob Lazar's interview hit television screens around the world. He said that he worked at an underground facility called S4. The top secret project was codenamed Galileo. They would call at a specific time. For instance, the operator would say, Mr. Lazar, it's now 4.15 a.m. We expect you to be at McCarran Airport 
at 4.45. Your plane will be leaving at such and such time. I drive there, check in, board the plane, and the plane would fly out to Groom Lake. It would land there. I'd get off the plane and wait, and there would be a bus to take me and whoever else is going to uh, S4, Papoose Lake, which is about 15 miles south of there. And uh, then I would check in at S4. Tell me about how you felt on your very first trip out. The first trip out there was uh, it was actually very exciting because it seemed so cloak and dagger to me, especially after I got in the bus with the blacked out windows. I, I kind of thought that was neat. Uh, drove out to the site and then uh, it was checked in, guards walking around with guns and uh, I, I was sure what I was working on was going to be pretty fascinating. He says that within a few days of working out at S4, he was shown an actual flying disc in one of the hangars. When I was brought in by bus, and for the first time, one of the hangar doors, the one on the end, was open. The bus drove up and we stopped there, and at clear as day in the hangar, taking up almost all the hangar, was the disc. Uh, looked like something right out of a science fiction movie. And as I walked in there, I thought, well, this is the new advanced aircraft we've been working on, and this is why people keep seeing flying saucers, because it's ours, and we've just been testing it probably for all these years. And what, what color and size was it? It was a uh, dull stainless steel, pewter gray, very uh, unimpressive color-wise. About 52.8 feet in diameter and about 16 feet high. So was it actually a recovered craft that you were working on or was it one that um, scientists had built as a mock-up of, of a recovered craft? Well, whether it was recovered, given or what, it was not built as a mock-up. It, it was an alien craft built on another world. There was absolutely no doubt about that. Lazar claims that he was one of only 22 people who had something called majestic clearance to work on the craft itself. The whole aim of the project was to take these craft, or the one in particular that I was working on, and try and duplicate its systems and subsystems with earthly materials. The work that I did basically entailed back engineering the power and propulsion system. And I opted to start with the, uh, the power, the, the reactor that, that ran the craft. I knew immediately if his credentials could be verified, if even part of his story could be verified, it'd be one tremendous expose. George Knapp was a long-standing TV reporter. He'd heard enough of the UFO rumors over the years to appreciate how big a scoop this could be if Lazar was telling the truth. He gave me uh, uh, information about his background, educational background and employment background. I started with, uh, with his claim to have worked at Los Alamos Lab. We went to Los Alamos and uh, got nothing uh, even close to cooperation. Uh, they wouldn't uh, respond to our phone calls. They say we have no information on Bob Lazar. There's nothing in the files. I said, are you sure now? No, nothing in the files. I showed him uh, the, f the phone book entry that Bob had kept that said, uh, he was there. I showed him the newspaper article that, that showed that he was there. Basically, uh, Los Alamos Lab um, tried to thwart me at every step. We're completely uncooperative in trying to get information about Bob, and I, and I found that to be the case at every step of the way in trying to verify his background. Thursday, 12 
6.37 p.m. Former NASA mission specialist Bob Exler had heard about Area 51 and Groom Lake when he worked on the Apollo and Space Shuttle projects. He was intrigued by Lazar's claims and started to investigate. Uh, I did uh, a variety of research uh, relative to Bob Lazar. I actually met him. Uh, I obtained a copy of his, uh, what they call a W-2 form, which is one of the um, uh, IRS documents associated with, uh, with pay. Uh, his particular form indicated that he worked for the U.S. Department of Naval Intelligence. Um, they informed me that it was a genuine document. It was not something that had been fabricated. There were a variety of numbers, uh, contract numbers and so forth, uh, issued on the document, which I was able to research, again, finding that uh, these were uh, highly classified uh, numbers. In fact, uh, Internal Revenue Service ran into a, a brick wall when it came to trying to track down uh, the actual employer uh, associated with the, with the document. And then again, with the Social Security Administration, we found that Bob Lazar's records had in fact been, been bleached clean. There was nothing there in spite of the fact that the document uh, clearly indicated that uh, Social Security taxes had been taken out of his pay. everyone whose research Bob Lazar believes his claims. Stanton Friedman is one of the most respected authors in the UFO field today. He's a former nuclear physicist with top secret clearance and has many friends and contacts in the Black Project world. I've looked at considerable depth into Bob Lazar's claims both about himself and about propulsion systems. Those are fairly elaborate claims. I've talked to the schools that he claims to have received degrees from. I've checked on his high school record. I talked to Los Alamos lab where he was supposedly a scientist and so forth. I have come up totally empty. Now when a guy lies like that, you get very wary. And you know, it has all the trimmings, his story, of a Walter Mitty story somebody in his imagination was, you know, stronger, brighter, faster than anybody else. I don't doubt that he did some work at Los Alamos and other places. He's clever. He drives a jet-powered car, fixes radiation detectors. So he may have performed some service, but I can find no reason to think that he worked out there on a flying saucer. I mean, I had to wonder whether this guy was making this stuff up, but then I see the phone book and I see the newspaper article and I talk to people who work with Bob at the lab and who said, in fact, that he did work on classified projects, yet no one can find any records of his background. The people that I worked with, colleagues, the people I went to school with, obviously knew I was there, uh, and the people at Los Alamos, I was friends with and people that worked under me and alongside of me, knew I was there and, you know, cooperate was going on, but, um, you know, officially, it's very difficult to get information for the people in charge. To further prove his claims, Lazar agreed to take a polygraph test, which he passed. The thing that uh, is interesting about polygraph is that if you're embellishing or if you don't completely believe what you're saying, it is very, very easy to detect. Uh, all it really will tell you is that the individual believes with 100% conviction that what he's reporting is exactly as he recalls and as he believes it to be. And that clearly was the case with Bob Lazar. Now, could his perception have been a, a bit askew? Yes, that's possible. But he clearly wasn't lying.
I think Bob is even open to the possibility that perhaps he had been used in some sort of misinformation or disinformation campaign. I mean, look at him. He has a pirate flag floating on his house. He races jet cars. He likes uh, fast women. He likes guns. Um, he w he's technically capable, so in that sense, he may be perfect for this kind of a program. Technically capable, scientifically knowledgeable, and yet uh, completely discreditable at a, at a moment's notice. If you wanted to uh, test public reaction to a story about Area 51 and then suddenly discredit it afterwards, Bob may have been the most qualified person in the country. The Tsar says that on one occasion, he was escorted into the flying disc that he saw in the hangar to analyze its propulsion system. It was obviously made uh, to be piloted by something smaller than the average human being, uh, very cramped in there. Um, what were the size of these seats that were in there? The seats were very small, I'd say about one-third to one-fourth the size of a normal human seat. A lot of people, a lot of people say, boy, it must have been exciting to go in there, and I, and I always say it, it wasn't. It was a very ominous feeling. It, um, I know it sounds silly, but it, it, it's so unearthly in there. You have spoken to someone who's actually seen um, a UFO under a tarpaulin at Area 51. I have. Uh, I've, I've spoken to several people who've seen UFOs or disc-shaped craft out there. There was, a, there was a woman who was a secretary for a major defense contractor at the Nevada test site who worked on nuclear programs who told me that she had sat in on, on uh, conversations between military and civilian contractors at which the Roswell case had been discussed at which it had been discussed taking some Roswell material to Area 51. Uh, the level of secrecy during those meetings was great. Afterward, they'd take the, the ribbons out of the typewriters she was typing on. She was ready to tell me about this, and I had this conversation with her on the phone. The next day after this conversation takes place, she's visited by two men who say that they work for the company she used to work for reminding her that she is still under a security oath, told her, we know that you do a lot of traveling back and forth, a lot of long drives between Las Vegas and L.A. We'd hate for something to happen to you or your family. No interview. I mean, it happened again and again and again. Same scenario. Lazar says that in addition to being shown inside the disc, he actually saw it take off from the lake bed. I was brought into the hangar for one of the short duration tests and the craft was already outside on the lake bed and that was uh, pretty much of a marvelous sight. It's a huge thing. It, I, it's like seeing a house lift off the ground. You, you can't imagine the energy involved to do that. Because of the uh, extremely high energy output and the fact that the outside of the craft does is used as a conductor, that does ionize the air. And the crafts do, as a byproduct of this, glow at night, uh, much like a fluorescent tube will light up. So, you know, bright, strange, jumping lights in the sky, that, that does explain that. Would you categorically say there is no way that, that humans could have built the craft that you saw? Absolutely, I will categorically deny <laughs> that, well, I don't know, how exactly should I put that? I guess I can just say it straight out. There is, there is no way that any government on this earth could produce that craft, period. And I defy anyone to argue that point.
One of the big questions that's hung over this whole story is whether Lazar saw a man-made flying disc and not an alien spacecraft. A lot of these craft which are being developed in secrecy in, in the United States are tested at night and one can imagine that seen through kind of half-closed eyes, something like an F-117 stealth fighter or a B-2 bomber, side-on or front-on, would look remarkably like, say, a flying saucer or a UFO. You see an F-117 or you see tacit blue um, or you see uh, a B-2 particularly if you see it from some fairly unusual angle, you're going to have a very hard time relating that to conventional aircraft. Um, some of these things can look very strange indeed. Um, so, you know, an unusual but decidedly terrestrial aircraft um, can certainly present the appearance of a disc from many angles. I think for anyone who's, who's been out into the western United States and seen the kind of place it is and let their imaginations run riot a bit, it is possible to imagine in, its, in these vast test areas technologies which are highly exotic, highly uh, revolutionary and would change the way we feel about science today. However, to say that that is alien science derived from beyond this world, I think is something which is just, it is unbelievable. It's too much to, uh, to absorb. Do you think that some of the truth certainly lies out there in the middle of the Nevada desert at Groom Lake? I would expect that some of the truth may very well lie out in the desert near Groom Lake. It's the right place for some of it to be. It's isolated, it's under control, it's high security. I don't think we've yet scratched the surface on what's happening out there with regard to flying saucers. According to Lazar, the craft that they were secretly testing out in the desert at night used an exotic anti-gravity propulsion system. The reactor itself was an incredibly advanced system. This is, uh, was an antimatter reactor. This is something we could only dream of having, something that could without huge amounts of power that rivals several nuclear power plants running at capacity. What happens is a great gravity distortion is created and you're essentially bending space toward the craft. The craft becomes part of that space and then when the reactors or when the gravity amplifiers are shut down, the craft is essentially where it was focused. It's a very difficult thing to grasp. It happens virtually instantaneously because of the fact that gravity distorts time and if you're bending space and time along with it, when you wind back up in that place, you're there between the ticks of a clock. Looking at uh, nighttime video films out in the uh, uh, test site area, 
we've seen video of craft that were uh, luminous that would move across the sky as if it was uh, skipping a stone across water or, or sort of a sewing machine effect. What we see across the screen are a series of uh, lights, of dashes of light uh, as the object moves from point A to point B. Therefore, we are seeing uh, what you might call a shadow effect of the propulsion mechanism at work.